Well, good morning. morning. Good to be in God's house today, man. Yes. Amen. I got to take care of a little housekeeping duties before I um, before I begin to preach. And Paul, I don't know what uh, for sure you're wanting out of this, but I'm going to take care of it. He said it was National Red Nose Day. Now uh, I, I don't know. I had some people say they weren't sure of that, but. Uh, I got to keep my uh, AV guy happy. He's the one that edits the tapes and puts them on the internet. So now I kind of sound like Willie Nelson, don't I? <laughs> so Paul, is this good? I'm not going to preach the whole message to that. Hi there. Yeah, hey, hey. Yeah. So uh, if you're pulling my leg, then uh, the preacher just looked foolish. But, but you, you joined in with it too, didn't you? So we're, we're good. Yes. So thank you for all you do, Paul. I know you do a lot of editing the videos behind the scenes, and I appreciate that. So got to keep this guy happy. Oh, that's funny. Well, good morning. Good to be in God's house today, man. Amen. Hey, man, if you have a Bible, I'd like to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 8 this morning. We're going to look at Acts chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at verses 26 through 40 today. Today we continue on in our series Celebrate Jesus. And we're going to be talking today about another invitation that God gives us. In fact, for the past several weeks, we've looked at many invitation that, the invitations that God gives to us. Uh, we looked uh, the first week about the invitation to the table. We talked about how Jesus invited his disciples to uh, enjoy and celebrate the Lord's Supper. Actually, it was the uh, Passover Supper that he instituted the Lord's Supper through. And how many of you were here for the Lord's Supper the last time we had it? Raise your hand. Okay, there's some of you who missed that, and I would like to offer one more time, because I have some left. Uh, when Lisa and I were in Israel, we uh, bought these olive wood uh, communion cups. And uh, anybody who was here for Lord's Supper, we put those in there. We didn't think about the fact that it's wood and it absorbed the juice into it, so we kind of panicked and had to fill them back up last minute. But, but they worked. I think it's kind of cool. They've got the stains in them where the, the, white, the juice was in there. If you weren't here and you didn't get one of these cups uh, and you'd like to have one, I still have plenty of them left. So you see me after service or sometime, and I'd be glad to give you one of these because everybody got to keep their cups after the communion service. And this is actual olive wood from Bethlehem that was made into these cups. So if you'd like to have one of those and you didn't get one, or maybe you've got somebody close to you that you'd like to give one that make maybe an impact on them, you let me know and, and I'd be glad to give you one of those cups. So we talked about an invitation to the table. Jesus invites us uh, to, to enjoy the table. Then we talked about an invitation to follow Jesus. And how Peter himself said, Jesus, I'll, I'll, I'll die for you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do anything for you. And he was ready to go to battle for Jesus. And, and then when things got tough, Peter turned on him, and, and Jesus had predicted it. And, and Jesus, uh, Peter denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. Remember that story about how, how that happened? And so Peter uh, kind of wanted to follow Jesus when things were good, but when it got tough, he, he cowered away. But then he was reinstated by Christ and, and, uh, and how God's mercy is so awesome and how Peter became uh, a bold disciple for Christ after he saw the resurrected Christ. Because last Sunday was Easter and we looked at an invitation to experience the resurrection. Uh, we've all, who are believers in Christ, experienced the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that means that we've experienced not just coming to church and not just, you know, reading the Bible and not just, you know, doing the church things, but we have experienced the risen Lord in our hearts and lives, that Jesus is alive, that Jesus came and he died for us and he rose from the dead and, and he gives us eternal life uh, through that. And so he invites us to experience that resurrection personally on the inside. And today uh, we're going to talk about another invitation. It's an invitation to share Jesus. You know, sharing Jesus should be a natural thing. It should be a non-negotiable. Every follower of Jesus Christ should be ready to, to, to share Christ. It should be, amen, it should be a natural thing. It should be uh, a non-negotiable, but sometimes people don't share Christ like they should. Sometimes I even don't share Christ like I should, because do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world? Do you believe this world needs Jesus? If we do, then we're the ones God is called to share Christ with others. So it's a much needed ministry of sharing Christ. You know, why do we share Jesus? Well, we share because we care about people. We share because we're called by God to share. And we share because 
we know that people need Jesus. How many of you know somebody who needs Jesus in their life right now? We all do. If we look around, there's a multitude of people that God has placed in our path, in our lives, that need Christ in their life. So the invitation to share Jesus is this. Our call to salvation in Jesus always includes sharing Jesus. When you're called by Jesus to accept him as your Lord and Savior, it is automatic that you are called to share Christ too. Uh, sometimes we go for many years, sometimes a lifetime as a Christian, and never share Jesus with one person. And I don't understand how the greatest thing in our life and the greatest thing that ever happened and the God Almighty that saves us, we don't want to share that with others. It ought to be the greatest news that we ever have to share, but somehow we suppress that and we don't share Christ with others. But our call to salvation in Jesus always, always, say always, always, always includes sharing Jesus. Now the scripture today that we're going to look at is after Jesus had came and he lived here on this earth. He walked here on this earth for 33 years approximately. Jesus had publicly been in ministry for three years of that. Jesus had called his disciples. He had lived a perfect life. He had went to the cross, died uh, as a substitution for our sins. He went to the cross, the perfect Lamb of God, and he died for our sins. And through that, Jesus was buried. And we celebrated last week that Jesus rose from the dead. Amen? Amen? And if Jesus rose from the dead, then we need to listen to Jesus. We need to follow Jesus. And most of all, we need to share Jesus. I tell you what. Jesus, and, and if you don't want to believe this preacher, you don't want to listen to what I have to say, the Word of God, God's Son tells us that we share Him with others. The Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, Jesus, one of the last things He told His disciples was to go and to share and to baptize and make, make followers, disciples of Christ. It's a command. It's not an option. It's a command that God gives to us, that Jesus gave His disciples, and if we're a disciple of Jesus a follower of Christ, then we should be sharing also. Now, Jesus didn't stay here on this earth except for 50 days after he had arose from the dead. And then he ascended to heaven to be with, with the Lord. Amen. He spent time on here. You know where Jesus is right now? Can anybody tell me? Right he's at the right hand of God right now. You know what he's doing there? He's not crocheting and knitting. He's interceding for us. He, he's making intercession for our sins. He is saying, they belong to me, God. Uh, you listen, God. Uh, I made it, I've died for them. I've paid the price for their sins, and, and they're cleansed. And when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin and our filth and, and the things we've done wrong. So today there's people that think, I can never be forgiven by God. You can always be forgiven by God. You turn to Jesus, give your life to him, and Jesus will intercede for you, and he will be the, your advocate before the Father. You see, Jesus ascended to, to go back to heaven to be with the Father at the right hand. That's where he is right now. And as he, he went back to be in heaven, he gave them this commission to go, and then we go to the nations. We go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And what do we do? We share the gospel. The gospel was spreading. At this time in Acts chapter 8, the gospel had been spreading like wildfire. Why was it spreading? It's because the followers of Jesus took very seriously that they were to share Christ with anyone and everyone that they came in contact with. Peter himself, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given, Peter himself preached, and 3,000 people were saved that day. And that's, that's the work of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Did Peter save them? No, he didn't. What did he do? He shared Jesus. This Jesus whom you crucified is now Lord and Savior. And because of that, people put their faith in Christ, and they were saved forevermore. Now, they had started to send out uh, missionaries to go out and to preach the gospel and to share, not only with the Jews, but also with the Gentiles, not only with, with the, the Israelites, the God's people, the Hebrews, but God said, I, I came for all men. Jews, there's no difference. Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, whatever, it doesn't matter. We're all the same in God's eyes in need of a Savior, Jesus Christ. So they began to preach to the Gentiles. At this point in the scripture, they were preaching in Samaria. Now that was crazy because Samaria was a taboo place for Jews to go. But they chose to go there because God had called them to go share Jesus with the, those who did not belong to Christ. They had a prosperous ministry going on. They were sharing Christ, Peter and John, and, and, and then they had a problem in, in Jerusalem with the church. They, the church got so big that people were not being taken care of. And the Hellenistic Jews 
the Greek-speaking Jews, they began to complain. They complained, you're not taking care of our needs. We need stuff, and you're ignoring us. So what they do? They appointed the first deacons. There were seven men that was full of faith, that were followers of God, that they appointed to take care of some of the tasks in the church. We have deacons here in this church. The deacons are here not to be served, but to serve. They serve communion, but that's not the only thing they do. They serve the Lord, and they serve you. Now, Philip, the man we're going to look at today, Philip was one of those seven men. He was with them, and all of a sudden, Philip got this call from God to go and share with someone. We're going to stand, we're going to read this account of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch today. Let's stand. It says, now an angel, in verse 26, it says, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot And he was reading Isaiah the prophet. He was returning from Jerusalem. He'd traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. And then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him. And, And look at that. He ran to him. And he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I? Unless someone guides me. And he, asked him, Philip, and he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Then the place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led like sheep, as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you. Of whom does a prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at scriptures, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What what hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariots to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, and we thank you, God, for the time of worship that we've had so far to sing praises into you. And Lord, you're a mighty God, mighty to save. And Father, we do pray that you would set a fire deep down within us today, Lord. Father, if someone here today does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, today, let today be the day, God, that they would surrender their life and turn it over to Jesus, the Savior who's mighty to save them. Father, for us as believers, I pray that fire would be set burning in our hearts so deeply, God, that we couldn't control it, Lord. Father, we know that we need to be serving you and living for you, and and sometimes we fail you, God. But, Lord, you're a merciful God. You, You ask us, God, only to be faithful to you. And, Lord, we cannot be faithful to you if we're not sharing Jesus with others, God. Help us to be ambassadors for your kingdom. Help us to share Christ with all those we encounter, Lord, just as Philip did to this Ethiopian eunuch. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So this morning, I want to look at something here today in in light of sharing Jesus. I want to give you four things today that is involved, directly involved with sharing Jesus. Four things that are directly involved that I can see in this passage that are directly involved with sharing Jesus. Now, the first thing that it takes is motivation. Do you know that we get motivated by so many things in our life? And everybody is different about what motivates them. Sometimes people get motivated by food, amen? Amen. Baptists get motivated by food, right? If we have something going, that's right, Merle, amen, right? That's right. We like food. And uh, by the way, tonight, there is a, a, a food function at 5 o'clock. We're going to have a little uh, carry-in at 5 o'clock tonight. So come out and you can eat like we do best. 
And then afterwards, we're going to have a time of... Uh, uh, it's called Sunday school training, but don't be scared of that. It's not just for Sunday school teachers. It's for anyone to learn more about how to be effective in sharing Jesus with others, how to be effective in their walk with the Lord. So please come back to that. And there's food involved, right, Merle? Amen. Amen. So we've got to do that. Food. Some people are motivated by fun. You know, they want to just have fun in life, and they just want to have fun things to do. And some people spend a lot of money on doing fun things in their life. And they waste a lot of time sometimes, too much time. Oh, I say waste. Sometimes we need some fun, but sometimes we have a little too much fun, and we spend too much time and energy on fun. Now, some people are motivated by family. Sometimes our family, most of the time, our family motivates us, don't they? If our family has a need or her family has uh, uh, something that, that we can help them with or, or we need to be there for them or just to get together and have a good time or a fellowship or something like that, we're motivated by family and, and we love our families. Everybody loves their family. But then there's some people who are motivated by fishing. Amen, Gary? Amen. Some people are motivated by fishing, right? We love to fish. And, 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 and that's okay. Um, my grandsons are motivated by fishing, I can tell you that. And, you know, uh, we've been absent from them being here for about since Christmas. And uh, it's been a big transition for Lisa and I, I can tell you that. It's, it's been hard, but it's been good in a lot of ways, too. The goodness of that is that even though they've moved to Mount Sterling, every time I go there, every time I see them, they are happier than they've ever been. They, they have a place out in the country. My grandsons, they're outdoor backwoods boys, just like my son. They have 14 acres to run on. They can go out and be wild and they can run naked or whatever they want to do. It doesn't matter. And believe me, they don't need to be in town because I know over here they ran naked in town sometimes too. But uh, luckily the neighbors, they thought that was pretty cute. So maybe until they get up to teenagers, it may not be so cute. I don't know. But, but they're right where God wants them to be. I, I know that God's placed them there. And, and the best part about that acreage and the nice place they've got and everything, on the back side of it, it's got this big fishing pond. And my grandsons talk all the time. I was up there last Sunday afternoon for Easter, and all they wanted to do was go fishing, go fishing, go fishing. They go ice fishing. They, they fish in the spring. They fish in the summer. They fish in the fall. They fish in the winter. They can fish all the time. And there's a lot of fish in that pond. So, so they love to fish. And if their dad said, let's go fishing, they would be motivated to get ready and drop whatever they were doing and go fishing. So sometimes fishing motivates us. I know my grandsons, it does for sure. But what about God? What about when it comes to God? Are we really motivated when it comes to, to God? Now, now, the first thing I want you to think about here for a minute, are you motivated enough to listen to God? And, and here's what I'll say to that. When's the last time you've heard God speak to you? Now, I'm not talking about audibly, you know, you have to hear or, you know, see the skies part and he writes in the clouds or something like that. I'm talking about in your prayer time, if you have one, I hope you do. When have you prayed and allowed God an opportunity to talk to you? You know, God wants a relationship with us. And a relationship, if you have a relationship with somebody, do you know somebody that in, in the relationship all they do is talk and you can never say a word? Now, don't nudge the person beside you. You may get in trouble. But that's not really a, a healthy relationship. A healthy relationship means that you get to communicate back and forth together. A healthy relationship means that you not only speak, you also listen. But I hate to think how many people in their prayer life, they ask God, they pray to God, they're, you're fervently praying to God, but you don't listen to God. And, and God may be wanting to speak something to you, and he says, I can't get a word in edgewise. You're not listening to what I'm trying to say. God speaks to us in many ways. How many of us are motivated to please God? You know, there's a lot of times in our life that we want to do something or we're tempted to do something or something seems really fun or we want to do something besides church or something like that, but we know that we're motivated because we want to please God. It's okay to want to please God. It's okay to want to make God happy. What I want to do, if I want to make my wife happy, I search out what makes her happy. I know I have to take her and buy her a $5 cup of coffee to make her happy. Now, I can... I can get a can of Folgers, Merle, in the, in the church, and I can, I can drink it, and I'm happy with that. But sometimes you've got to get the little foo-foo stuff. Do you know what my wife likes to drink? I better not pick on her too much. She's not in here. We go up to that free press in Pittsfield, and she, she orders a sparkling hippie. 
Now that in itself, I'm embarrassed to order it. She sent me when one time to order it, and I'm like, nobody's around. I'm thinking, I need a sparkling hippie to go, please. And I'm like, <laughs> she goes, what do you want? No, no. <laughs> and, but, but I want to please her. So, so I was in Pittsfield here the other, last week, and I went and got her one. I took it down to school and gave it to her because I want to please her. How many things can you say this past week you've done to please God? That outright you've looked and you've sought and you've thought and you've prayed about, God, how can I please you? I'm not just saying showing up for church and I'm not just saying read your Bible. I mean, God, I want your heart. I want to know what you want. And God, I want to please you. How many of us are willing to go with God? You know, a lot of times we're willing to come, we're willing to sit, we're willing to listen. But if I read my Bible right, to be with God, we've got to go with God. In order to serve God, in fact, I heard it said one time, you can't stay where you are and go with God. God is always on the move. That's Henry Blackaby 101. God is always on the move. You see where God is moving, and you join him where he's at. Now, I'm not talking about picking up and moving, you know, to Texas or something. I'm talking about in your life, you see where God is. Oh, that's right. You guys are moving to Texas, aren't you? I actually didn't even think about that when I said that. I don't know if you heard God right on that or not, guys. I'm serious about that. Me and God's been praying about that, and we're just not, I'm not convinced yet that's what you're supposed to do. Actually, I am convinced that's what you're supposed to do. So, uh, I actually hadn't even thought about that when I said that. So, you can't stay where you are and go with God. Sometimes God calls us to go places we don't want to go and do things we don't want to do. Now, Philip was a prime example of those three areas that I just talked about. Philip was listening to God. Philip was trying to please God. And Philip was ready to go with God. Look at verse 26. Right off the bat, we can see this. Philip is in a prosperous area seeing lots of people saved. And all of a sudden, in verse 26, God interrupted Philip. Have you ever had God interrupt your life? All of a sudden, there's God. It, right off the bat in verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord, which angels do God's work, they, they don't dis, dis, there's no discrepancy about God's plan and work. The angels do what God calls them to do. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go. So what did Philip do? He heard God. He wanted to please God. And he wanted to go with God. You see, Philip was in the middle of a ministry that was booming. Philip was in the middle of something that was going on great. People were getting saved. He was with his buddies doing ministry. And all of a sudden, God called Philip, and the motivation was there that Philip wanted to listen to God, to please God, and to go with God, and let's see what happens. Are you motivated to, to share Jesus? The next thing it takes is identification. Motivation, identification. Identification. You've got to identify the direction that God wants you to go. In verse 26, the second part of it, he said, Arise and go. And he said, Towards the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, this is desert. And if you study into that, here's what God was calling him to do. God was calling him from a prosperous evangelistic ministry to go to a barren road in the middle of nowhere and head towards Gaza made no sense. There was a road, there was two roads that went from Jerusalem to Egypt, to, or to Gaza, that which went on to Egypt. And, and the two roads, one of them was a more traveled road, and the other one was a less traveled road. One was a deserted desert road, and God didn't call Philip even to go to the popular interstate highway. He called him to go to the secondary off-ramp and go on a road that nobody traveled in the middle of the desert during the middle of the day. And as God called him to do that, Philip heard that, and he didn't know why, and he didn't know what, but he knew that God had called him to a certain direction. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense when God calls us to do something. But we have to be obedient to God. We've got to be motivated to please God, to listen to God, and to go with God. So we identify the direction. When God called Abram to leave where he was. He said, get up and go and I'll show you where you're going to go. Sometimes all we have is a direction that God gives us and we don't have all the answers. How many of us, before we do anything for God, we want every answer known to man? Anybody? Raise your hands if you do. We do. I want to know details. 
I don't know what I'm going to be doing, where I'm going to be going, uh, what's going to happen, uh, how, what's the results, all that. Is that faith? Faith is following God just off his direction. Get up and go. God tells us to get, get up and go today. He doesn't want us to sit here. He wants us to go. Now, I'm not saying get up and leave right now. But God calls us to go out and do something. So, he identified a direction. Then he identified a person. Look at 27. So, he arose and went. He wanted to please God. He left everything to please God. So, he arose and he went... And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of the treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, as I see that, you know, I just see, okay, all of a sudden, Philip is walking down this deserted road in the middle of the day, and all of a sudden, he sees this guy. Now, it's not just a man, it's a high-ranking official in the Ethiopian queen, Candace, which Candace is not the name of the queen, it's like the title of the queen. It'd be like saying Caesar or something like that. It's, it's not the proper name. It's just the name of authority is Candace. She was the most powerful woman in all of Ethiopia. Great wealth. And this man was in charge of all the treasury. So in other words, he had a lot of power, a lot of money, and a lot of authority. And he wasn't traveling by himself, by the way. Sometimes we take that, you know, he would not have traveled by himself. He would have had this big entourage of people with him. A big caravan that would have been traveling. Now, he had went to Jerusalem, but he was on his way back to Ethiopia on that road. And so all of a sudden, Philip sees this person, this man. And I was thinking about that for a minute. And sometimes, and I've experienced this in my own life, sometimes God calls us to, to try to witness and be a minister to crowds. But then sometimes God calls us and gives us direction to one. In other words, when we go to Costa Rica, and I've been for many years, this is the first year I'm not going to go in many years. When we would go to Costa Rica, when we first started going there, it was all about, and, and, and rightly so, and a good thing, we were going into these big schools, and we would get an assembly of 500 kids, 1,000 kids, and, and we would preach Jesus to them, and many of these kids, and the teachers, and the faculty, and everybody would get saved, and I loved that. But then, all of a sudden, we'd been to most of the schools. And we desired to do something besides just going to schools. And so all of a sudden, we started going out into the uh, countryside, up into the mountains. And we would travel sometimes for three hours to get to maybe one little school with one time with nine kids in it and one teacher and one administrator. And we traveled three hours to get to that school. It took us most all the day just to get there and to, and to, and to get back. But we went into that school, and there was like nine kids compared to 500 to 10,000 or 1,000 kids. But when we spoke Jesus to them and played with them kids and, and showed them the love of God, every single student in there got saved. Even the teacher got saved. Even the administrator got saved in that school. The whole school was saved. Was it worth it? But we weren't back in, in um, Costa Rica, or we weren't back in Cartago, thank you preaching to 500 kids in a school. And then we started saying, you know what, there's these villages up in these mountains that we need to go to, and there's little churches that are struggling, trying to reach out. And so we'd start joining up with these other, other churches up in the mountains, and we would go out with the local church members, and we would go door to door talking about Jesus, didn't we, Cody? And that was amazing. That's my favorite time. I don't mind, and I love preaching to, to multitudes, but when you can go door to door and have a heart to heart talk with a lady that's got a child and, and they're down on their last dollar and they're out of hope and they're just looking for somebody and you can go and you can tell them about Jesus and they accept Christ and we've seen that so many times, that's what I love. You see, that's kind of where Philip was. He was preaching to the multitudes and, and thousands of people were getting saved. All of a sudden God calls him and God identifies one man that he's supposed to share with. And all of a sudden, Peter, or, uh, Philip realizes, this is a guy that God has called me to. I've been to I identified this one person. And, and I identified, and he not only identified their direction and the person, he also identified his position. Because it says in here in verse, uh, the last part of verse 27 and verse 28, it says he had charge of all the treasure and he'd come to Jerusalem to worship. Now this was a Gentile who traveled hundreds of miles 
to get to Jerusalem to worship in the temple, worship God. So this man was searching for something. All the false and foreign and pagan gods in Ethiopia did not seem to satisfy him. He went all the way to Jerusalem to worship God. And as he was returning, he was sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah. He was reading the Old Testament. That in itself was amazing because he had to spend a lot of money to get a piece of the Old Testament, which was Isaiah, to sit there and read it. And it was Isaiah chapter 53. Now you talk about God's providence. That's exactly what he needed to be reading. How many of you ever open your Bible up and you read and you read exactly what God wants you to read? All of a sudden you say, God, you're speaking to me right here and I had no idea. Now I'm not the fan of going in and putting your finger on the Bible and trying to guess what God wants. I don't, I don't like that. But when you're studying the Word of God and you're going through the Word of God and all of a sudden you're looking at the Word of God and it comes to life to you, you think, that's exactly what I need. Do you know that God laid that out for you? Just so you could know something to hold on to, something to help you, something to show you. And that's what this man had experienced. He identified this man's position. He was reading the Word of God. Now, he was religious. He was reading, but the best part about it was he was ready. He was ready for somebody to tell him how to make sense of life, how to make sense of what he was reading. How in the world can I find importance and significance in this world? All these false gods, even going to Jerusalem, hadn't satisfied him because it was a the Jews were worshiping God, but they were not worshiping the one who came as God's son to die for our sins. And he was still searching. Now, sometimes we have to identify the one that God has in our path. You remember I was talking about my grandsons and how they like to go out and fish in the pond. It's got a lot of fish. Well, at my house, I've actually got a pond too. Jason, can you pull that picture up, please? It's a little ornamental pond. I hope you can see that. It's kind of bright in here. Uh, can you see the pond there? It's kind of shaded, too. It's, it's just a little ornamental pond. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, just a small peanut-shaped pond that I, I built for Lisa a long time ago. And in that pond of about probably 200 gallons, there's one little koi fish. I mean, that little thing is about that big. I don't know how he survived for so long. We've had him for about six or seven years and every year, he freezes like a block of ice when that all freezes. And then he thaws out in the winter, and he comes back, you know, he goes dormant, and he comes back. And I think every year he's going to die. And he survived cats that have kind of preyed on him. He survived so many things. And that one fish in that pond, my grandsons have came, and I identified that there's a fish in that pond. Jason, show him the next picture. Do you see what's there? I don't know if you can see this or not. There is three fishing poles and one bank pole there, Gary. You'd be proud of them. They got a stick and made a bank pole. And they are targeting trying to catch that fish. Now, I'm wise enough to know they may accidentally catch that stinking fish someday. So when I bait their poles up, I take and I get a uh, paper clip and bend it out. And I put a little jig body on it and I let them throw it in. They think they're fishing. But you know what? They've identified that one fish... And they will spend hours right there trying to catch that stinking little fish. Their focus is on that one fish. Their focus is trying to catch that fish. How awesome would it be if God put one person in your life, and he probably has, and you took that kind of attention and focus and tried to catch that one person to try to share Jesus with that one. Those grandsons will spend hours out there trying to catch that fish and hover around that. That poor fish, it hadn't got a chance if I give him a real hook. I know that. That's what God calls us to, to identify the person that he has in our path. Next thing. We've got to be motivated. We've got to identify. But we also have to communicate. There's a lot of people who take for granted and say, that, or they try to use this excuse. I don't have to tell people about Jesus because I, the way I live my life shows that I belong to Jesus. Now, I know some of you probably have said that before, and there's nothing against that. I want you to live your life for Jesus. But I guarantee you there's somebody in your life that God wants you to do more than just act like a Christian and be a Christian to them. He wants you to share Christ with them. There's no doubt in my life that it's somebody that God wants you to. Now, Philip identified that, the Ethiopian eunuch, and look what happened here. In 29, it says, The Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. He was in tune with God's Spirit. Are we? 
He said, go and overtake it. And at that moment, look what Philip did. Philip ran to him. Can you imagine Philip running to catch that guy? When God said, you go to that Ethiopian unit, he didn't know him from Adam. He didn't know him at all. And there was a big entourage with him. He wasn't sitting out there by himself. There was maybe several men and, and people with him. But when he knew that was the one that God called him to, he took off running. He couldn't get there fast enough. So he ran to him, and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and here's what he said. He spoke. Do you understand what you're reading? It's kind of like today when we come up to somebody, and we know that they don't understand what it takes to get to heaven. How many of you know what it takes to get to heaven? There's a whole lot of people out there that don't. 90% of the people that I encounter that I say, are you going to heaven? Yes, or I'll say, do you believe in heaven and hell? Why, yes, I do. 99% of them will say that. Well, where do you think you're going to go? I'm going to go to heaven. Why are you going to heaven? Well, I try to be a good person. I do a good thing, and I, 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 I go to church and things like that. That will not get you to heaven. <laughs> Philip said, do you understand what you're reading, what just happened? In Isaiah chapter 53, it says that Jesus was led like a sheep to the slaughter and that he died for your sins. Do you think people need to hear that? Do you think you know somebody that God may be calling to you and you're not running to them, you're not even going to them, you're resisting going to them? Well, God, they don't want to hear. He could, Philip could have been intimidated by this rich man with all these people, all this, this, this entourage with him, but when he knew God called him, he ran to him. And he gave him an invitation by communication to receive the greatest gift known to man. He ran and he spoke to him. The man said, how can I? I don't understand. There's a lot of people out here that just don't understand how to get to heaven, how to understand the Bible, how to receive Jesus. How can I unless somebody tells me? How can I unless somebody explains it and somebody guides me? And here's what happened in verse 35. Look at verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth. You know what? If you're going to communicate with somebody, it's pretty, pretty much a given. You've got to open your mouth. You can't speak to somebody if you keep your mouth closed about Jesus. He opened his mouth. He began at Scriptures. Guess what? If you're going to talk to Jesus about somebody, open up the Scriptures. Do you know that the Scriptures speak for themselves? And when you begin to share Scripture, God begins to speak to them. Don't think that you're going to lead somebody to Christ. God's Word, God's Spirit is going to draw them to Him. God just wants to use your mouth to use as a mouthpiece for that. He used Scripture. And he began his scripture, and he told him how to be saved. And look at this in verse 35. He preached Jesus. He just preached Jesus to them. You know, that's the same for us today. If you're going to communicate with people how to be saved, you need to use the gospel, scripture, and you've got to open your mouth. Last thing here. The four things involved with sharing Jesus. Motivation, identification of who it is. Communication of the greatest message ever known. But finally, there's celebration. Celebration. You see, after Philip explained to this man how to be saved, in verse 36, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Why can't I be baptized? And in verse 37, I know in some of the oldest manuscripts, it is not in there. You may even have a translation of the Bible that does not have verse 37, and that's okay. But here's an important part that I want you to understand. Even though it may not be in the earliest manuscripts, it's through the whole Bible. Here's what you have to do. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. You know, the illustrations that we see here are quite vivid. You know, my grandsons, they have been trying to catch that fish for a long time. And about a month ago, they were all at my house. And they were fishing like they always do at that stinking little pond. And I was outside doing something and all of a sudden, they all started screaming and yelling and excited. And I thought, oh boy, they've pushed Emmett into the pond. He's, he's in the water. And so I come running. And I ran over there, and all of a sudden, Easton's got this bucket. And he has accidentally scooped in and scooped that stinking fish out of the water. And they thought they'd caught a whale. 
little bitty fish. And they're in there, and that fish is swimming around, and he's traumatized by all this. And they're screaming and hollering and excited. Easton caught the fish. Easton caught the fish. Easton caught the fish. And I said, great, put him back. <laughs> but you know what they did out of natural tendency? They celebrated one fish getting caught. One fish, one little bitty fish. I mean, you couldn't, if you filleted that thing, you wouldn't even get a toothpick bite out of that. But they'd focused and identified what their target was. And even though maybe accidentally he stumbled onto it, he caught a fish. Isn't that the way we ought to be when somebody comes to Jesus? Just like a little child catching a fish. You know, here just a few weeks ago, <coughs> There was somebody who was caught by Jesus. Right, Carrie? Came to the point that she realized, just like all of us have, or most of us have, that she needed Christ in her life. She'd been in church, and she'd, you know, was trying to do the right thing. She's a good person. She works hard. I know that. But she came to the point that she realized, and, and I was able to share with her Christ. She just needed somebody to explain to her exactly what she needed to do. And it wasn't me that saved her. It was God's Holy Spirit that was already working. Just like in the Ethiopian unit, God was already working in his heart. He'd already traveled all the way to Jerusalem trying to figure it out, and he couldn't. Even the religious leaders couldn't tell him how to be saved because they didn't know. And all I did was share Jesus how to be saved. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And at that moment, Carrie prayed to receive Jesus right in my office, her and Bruce. And her life was changed. That change was immediate and impactful. I saw it. You know the greatest part about sharing Christ with someone? When they accept Christ, you can see the weight of the world come off of them. You can see that they're relieved because their sins are forgiven. You can see that they want to be obedient to Jesus and they want to just follow Jesus. And here's what happens. We celebrate, folks. We need, when somebody gets saved, the celebration ought to be bigger than a bunch of little kids catching a little fish in a pond. We ought to be shouting and screaming and dancing and running up and down the aisles. Go ahead. I don't care. A lost person was saved. A dead person was found and given life. A sinner was forgiven. Someone was grabbed out of the depths of hell where they were headed to and Jesus gave them life. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be, you may be saved. You may be baptized. Folks, you know where we stand in this church, baptism doesn't save you. Only Jesus can save you. But when you get somebody who's been saved by the blood of Jesus, who's been born again, given new life, and they follow an obedience in baptism as an act of obedience to Jesus, folks, we need to celebrate that in a powerful way. Today, we're going to celebrate that here in a moment with a baptism. But before we do, I know that God has called you, if you're a follower of Christ, like he called Philip, to be obedient. You may not stand in front of a crowd of people and preach the Word of God or, or stand in a stadium and, and sing glory to God. But there's one, just like Philip, that God calls you to. And it may be on the deserted path that you think, why in the world have you got me here, God? And all of a sudden you see, that's the reason why. That person needs Christ. And you run to them and you share with them and you explain with them that Jesus is the answer in your life. So my question to you today, and you can take it or you can leave it, but I hope you take it. Who's your one? Who's the one person that God has called you to be Philip to the Ethiopian? Who's willing to go the extra mile? Who's willing to open their mouths? Who's willing to share Scripture? You don't have to know every Scripture in the Bible. If you don't know how to share Christ, you come to me or one of the deacons or Mike or somebody. We'll show you how to lay out the plan of salvation. It's, it's not that hard. Even I understand it. But the truth is, you've got somebody. And if you don't have that somebody, then God is waiting to give you somebody. 
you know, across the North American Mission Board right now, there's a campaign going on called Who's Your One? And I chose to wait until today to share that. It was started the first of the month. But it basically says, Who's Your One? There's not a Christian in this room today. If you're saved by the, if you're saved by the blood of Jesus, say amen. amen. Then God has called you and invited you to share Jesus with someone. So at this invitation time, Cody, if you want to go ahead and come on up, there's these cards that say, who's your one on them? There's a place where you can write a name. If you've already got that one, you can write that name on there today. But if not, you take it home and you begin to pray, God, who's my one that you're calling me to? If everybody in here that's a believer in Christ would share with one person, this church and this community could be turned upside down. You're not in charge of the results. God is. If somebody rejects you, that's good. They, they're rejecting Jesus, not you. And you just find someone else to share with, and you continue to pray for them. On this card, there's a place to put that person's name. There's a 30-day scripture passages, different ones, to pray for that one person that's talking about people accepting Christ. And on the back, it says, who's your one? And there's a website and all that. So what we're going to do here in a moment at invitation... If you want to be a part of this, and, and I hope so, I'm going to ask that you come and get one of these cards, and I'm going to lay them here at the altar, and you begin to pray. Maybe you already got that one, but if you don't, that doesn't matter, because God already knows. It could be the Ethiopian eunuch out on the, on the desert road that God's waiting for you to get serious about sharing with. And I want you to come and take one of these anyway and pray, God, show me who I need to put in here and put them in my path. If, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, and, and when you pick this up, you can pray at the altar for the, that one. Maybe you know that one or you don't. But just, just pray, God, I want to know the one. But I know somebody here today, in a, in a crowd this size, like I always say, somebody here today, you're the one. You know that you need Jesus in your life, and God is speaking to your heart. And right now you're thinking, there's no way that I can step out and confess Jesus and ask him to come into my life. Well, let me tell you, that's, that's the best thing you can do. And if you think these people here are going to laugh at you or talk about you, they're going to celebrate with you if you accept Christ today. And so my prayer would be this, that at this invitation time, that you would step out and say, I'm the one. I'm like that Ethiopian eunuch, and I'm looking, and I can't find, and I need Jesus in my life. Father, we thank you, God, for this day, and we thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would just speak to that one today who needs Christ in their life, that if they would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in their hearts that you raised them from the dead, Jesus from the dead, that they could be saved today. Father, help us to be faithful to, just like Philip, to whatever it is. We may have to go out of the way or go somewhere that doesn't seem to make any sense, or we may they may already be in our path, but someone who needs Christ, that we would come and, and we would pray for that one for the next 30 days. Be vocal, be confident, and to share Jesus with someone. Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you just going to play at this time, Cody?